Our speaker today is Luis Cocola, who, who will be telling us about recent advances in the theory and implementation of multi-parameter persistence. All right, so thanks a lot for the invitation and thank you everyone who's uh, here and maybe who'll watch it later. Um, so yeah, I tried to come up with kind of a clickbaity title and abstract, don't tell you very much about what I'm gonna say, so you would come. And so thank you very much for actually uh, coming. So um, yeah, let's start. Uh, let's start with some motivation coming from one parameter persistence. So uh, the typical one parameter persistence pipeline is gonna be something like, I'm gonna start with a point cloud. I'm gonna apply some possibly well-known filtration such as Vietteris scripts. I'm gonna get some filtered space or filtered some shell complex. I'll then apply some uh, topological invariant, usually homology, and I'll get a persistence module. And then I'll want to represent that module in some kind of geometric way that I can either look at or feed to a machine learning pipeline. And for that, we like persistence diagrams or barcodes, and, and we get something that is kind of geometric in, in kind of essence. So that works really well when the metric that you started with, this, this specific pipeline that I outlined here, works very well when the metric of your point cloud uh, really approximates the topology that you want to understand. So what I'm calling metric-based topological inference, but it's not very suitable when you want to do some density-sensitive topological inference. So say you want to do density-based clustering, which is basically about inferring the number of connected components of high-density regions. So here's a little example. I have this synthetic data set uh, from this paper where there's, there's supposed to be six clusters, but if I just apply Vitoris RIPs and apply H0, H0, I get a persistence diagram like this. And I kind of see two high persistence classes that if you go back to the data actually correspond to like basically all the data set and some like far away point like that one. So the persistence diagram is not really telling me anything about the data set because of these uh, kind of points that, that are between uh, the clusters. So I uh, know if you want to fix that, uh, we already have several ways of doing that. And if you, if you just like one parameter persistence, there are very successful uh, kind of approaches um, for, for doing this. So the, the typical thing that you will do um, is to, well, as, like the general pipeline is to first get a filtration and then get a descriptor. So as filtration, we are going to often fix a graph now. And then we're also going to fix a density estimator on the data points. And we're going to filter that graph by um, the density estimator. We're going to use that descriptor, say, a persistence diagram. And uh, well, we will have to make some choices. We're going to have to fix that graph. So we're going to have to, say, use a distance scale to get a single Pietris Rips graph. And um, we're going to also have to fix this density estimator, which is often going to be done with, a, say, a kernel density estimator, which requires a choice of kernel bandwidth. An example of this uh, approach is the tomato clustering algorithm uh, by Chassal, Guivas, Udot, and Scraba. And it works very well, but you need to be able to make these choices. Um, a, a kind of more uh, choice-free approach uh, is what I'm calling the interactive slicing to parameter approach. So what you're going to do first is use some choice-free two-parameter filtration, and I'm going to describe this in the next slide. And then as a descriptor, you're going to use, for example, the Hilbert function and the Betty numbers, which you can just apply without having to choose anything. But this uh, kind of two invariants don't really tell you very much about persistence. So what software like Rivet does is it also lets you choose a one parameter slice. And I'm gonna show you an example of, of running, of, of using this pipeline in, in a few uh, slides, but for now uh, you have the two parameter filtration, you do some interactive back and forth, choosing one parameter slices inside this two parameter filtration. You look at the barcode of each of these slices, and then maybe at some point you find some suitable one parameter slice after this interactive back and forth. And the interaction works really well, as we will see. But in some cases, maybe you don't want to interact. We just You just want to get one single description of your module that you don't have to kind of engineer uh, by trial and error. So this would be this kind of ideal approach in which we have a choice-free two-parameter uh, approach, where we have a choice-free two-parameter filtration. We have some invariants. That these are invariants that we already know. But again, they don't really tell you much about persistence. So there's the question of, what else can we do to summarize um, 
a two-parameter filtration. There's not going to be any choices, but of course, so far, we don't really have uh, software that does this in general. So this talk is going to be about tell, uh, telling you a little bit about um, this, these two bike filtrations that are uh, choice free, and then about uh, this uh, question of what other invariants are there where we don't have to make any choices to visualize them or to feed them to a machine learning pipeline, say. So let's start with choice free bike filtrations. And actually, let's start with a bike filtration that requires a choice to motivate why we want choice free bike filtrations. So the simplest thing you could do is called density rips, where what you do is you fix a density estimator, and then you take the Pieter's rips on one dimension, and then you filter it in another direction using the density estimator. Um, now, in order to get your density estimator, you're gonna have to make some choices and things can go wrong. So here's an example where things go right. Here's a data set and uh, I colored it using a density estimator, a kernel density estimator with some small, uh, some small bandwidth so that the densest uh, part of the data set is actually the circle. And then here on the uh, horizontal axis, I'm doing the other strips and on the vertical axis, I'm filtering by density. And if you want to be covariant, it's going that way. Um, so you see that now there is a large part of the parameter space in which I'm seeing the circularity, and that's good. This two-parameter filtration is capturing the circularity of the data. But if I choose my density estimator wrong, I choose a bandwidth that is too large, what's going to happen is that the densest part of the data set is actually going to be the middle of it. And now, uh, no matter where I look in this uh, bike filtration, there's no circle to be found because when I filter, I keep only the points in the middle because these are the densest according to this choice of density estimator. So I made a choice and it wasn't good. So this is a motivation for choice-free uh, multi-parameter filtrations. Let me give you two examples. The first one is what I think is the simplest one. It's called degree rips and it was introduced by Lesnik and Wright, but it's kind of implicit in earlier algorithms like dbscan, which is a clustering algorithm. Um, it takes two parameters. One is going to be a distance scale, like the Torres rips, and the other one is going to be a density threshold. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the Torres rips in one direction again, and then in the other direction, we're going to filter by the degree of the vertices. So we're going to take the subcomplex of the Torres rips, spanned by the vertices of degree at least k times the number of points. This uh, times the number of points is kind of a normalizing constant, so that k is always between zero and one which is pretty convenient when you're working with data sets with different numbers of points. So that's one. And the other one is called the multicolor by filtration, uh, which is a bit more sophisticated. It's a particular case of the measure by filtration introduced by Chassel, Steiner, and Meljot, I think. And um, uh, this is kind of a, a check type of construction or an offset type of construction. It looks like this. This is the um, kind of the offset uh, dimension. And then this is the, the density dimension. So the offset works as before. You just take balls and you enlarge them. But then in this direction, instead of just putting the union of all balls, you take the union of the k-fold intersections of these balls. So only points that are in a very dense region, so that belong to many balls, belong to the bifiltration when, um, when k is very large. And again, I'm using some normalizing constant so that it's again indexed between 0 and 1. Let me tell you a few things about these uh, filtrations. So um, it's very interesting, and this is observed in this paper by Bloom or proved in this paper by Bloom or Lesnick. Uh, degree rips and the multicolor by filtration have a very nice multiplicative relationship, just like rips and check do. So what that means is that this uh, by filtration has kind of better theoretical properties, as we will see, uh, but this one is much cheaper to compute. Um, but this multiplicative relation tells you that you can still use this one degree rips for inference purposes. So here's, here's uh, some of what we know about these bike filtrations. First of all, degree rips is not choice free. Uh, I mean, uh, density rips, sorry. Density rips is not choice free, as we saw. It's not robust to outliers. There's a, a precise way in which you can quantify that, although in practice, it actually works very well in the presence of outliers. Uh, it has this nice property that we kind of take for granted for many for one parameter persistence, but it becomes kind of problematic in two parameter persistence. That is that the vertices of my simplicial uh, filtration are just the data points, and we know how to compute the homology in polynomial time. 
for degree rips, we have essentially uh, the same good properties, except that it is also choice free. So this is kind of one reason uh, why we might prefer degree rips over density rips because we don't have to make these choices. And then the multi-cover by filtration, it's very nice because it's now uh, robust, like theoretically robust to outliers. Um, but that comes at the expense of having all the simplicial um, ways of describing this, this filtration that we have don't have the zero simplices be the data points. There, there's kind of many, many more vertices and that can be problematic. In particular, now computing homology in polynomial time is pretty non-trivial and we know how to do it only kind of for low dimensional data. And if you want to know more about that, I really recommend these papers where uh, kind of this, this type of things are proven. And also uh, this paper by Shihi and by Bloomer and Lessig, which are kind of more theoretical about the relationship between the multicolor by filtration and subdivision check. Um, so yeah, so that's that's all I want to tell you about uh, two parameter by filtrations. The takeaway is that we have a pretty efficient one uh, that works very well. And in order to show you that it works very well, I actually want to demo a new software for doing density-based clustering with inter interactive multi-parameter persistence. So this is something that you can install uh, right now. And it's developed with Alexander Rolly. And uh, yeah, let's, let me show you how this works. So here I have a data set that, um, it's it's a it's a data set uh, collected by Uber, and it's uh, Uber Uber pickup locations um, in New York City for some period of time that I don't remember. It has a bit more than half a million points, and yeah, it looks like this. So maybe you want to do density-based clustering to kind of find hotspots uh, having to do with pickup locations. Um, okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is run uh, persistable. I'm going to subsample 30,000 points because uh, for interactivity um, interactivity purposes, subsampling is kind of uh, important in this case, but see that we are still uh, subsampling a, a lot of points. So I, the graphical user interface in this case with 30,000 points is going to take maybe 10 seconds to start. And once it has computed, I'm going to go to my browser and open the graphical user interface. If you have seen Rivet, this is very similar to Rivet. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about the comparison between the two uh, softwares in a second. But the first thing that I'm going to do is uh, compute the Hilbert function. So here, what I did, what I have is degree rips, as I um, described it before. I have the distance scale as x-axis and the density threshold as a y-axis. And I just uh, took a grid of 30 by 30 and computed the, um, the dimension of, hom of zero homology at all these uh, points in the grid. So you see that if I hover over uh, the plot, I see, for example, here I have two connected components. Uh, so my homology has dimension two. Here I have three, here I have five. So we see that as you would kind of expect, most of the interesting stuff happens when the distance scale is, is kind of small and the density threshold is also kind of small, so over here. Um, so having seen this, maybe I'm going to say, OK, maybe I want to focus on this more interesting region. And we're going to do that by coming here and choosing a smaller distance scale. I'm going to choose 0 0.02. And since this grid seems kind of coarse, I don't really see too much here. I'm going to use an 80 by 80 grid. Um, and while it computes, it's maybe going to take 15 seconds. I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about the similarities and differences between Rivet and Persistable. Um, both Rivet and Persistable can do zero homology. Uh, Persistable right now is only focusing on zero homology because uh, we want to do clustering. So we, we are not doing higher homology right now. And we're also not handling general bifiltrations. We are just using the degree rips um, just for simplicity. And also because we have highly optimized algorithms that work in this kind of uh, specific case. So we are using algorithms that come from this uh, paper and from this uh, the code uh, with this paper by Lilian McInnes, John Healy, and uh, Steve Astels. Um, and what that lets us do is, is again, uh, do clustering very, very, very fast. And yeah, the, the final thing that River cannot do that we can do is extract clusterings in the end. So this finished computing. So let's let's look at this Hilbert function. 
the first thing I want you to uh, see is that two parameter persistence can be very complicated. If I just look at this, uh, it's kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, weird in the beginning. So if I hover it over it, I see that maybe here there are five connected components. But if I want to get more than five, I have to start looking into this region. And this region is very, very unstable. As I change the parameters a little bit, the number of connected components starts varying quite a lot. So this is where the rivet approach uh, pays off. What I'm gonna do is select a single line and I'm gonna uh, make my line go through this kind of interesting region where things are varying a lot. And now what I'm gonna try to see is what persists along that line. So I'm gonna compute the persistence diagram over that line, which looks like this. And now uh, I wanna kind of separate between noise and topological features, robust topological features. So as usual, I'm gonna try to see how many high persistence things uh, I have. Uh, then I expect to have some gap and then the low persistence stuff. So in order to find that gap, uh, we have this inter interactive uh, thing where you can choose the gap number and it's gonna draw it for you. Uh, so I see that if I choose, for example, say uh, 10, uh, 10 uh, high persistent features, there's kind of a, a reasonable gap between the 10th most persistent class and the 11th one. So maybe that means that maybe I should try to look for 10 clusters. And after I have seen that, I can choose my parameters and go back to uh, my Jupyter notebook, get my clustering in a way that is very similar to what Tomato does and plot the clustering. And, and this is what we get for this choice of parameters. Um, we see that um, we are kind of clustering uh, Manhattan as a single cluster, which is not separated because it's kind of very, very dense and doesn't have a lot of fluctuation in density. Uh, this is Jersey, or rather the, the most dense part of, of Jersey. This is Brooklyn, and this is Queens, basically. Um, now, it's interesting that Brooklyn and Queens are kind of being separated because of some fluctuation here in density. Um, and then uh, another interesting thing that you'll see in this specific clustering is that there's kind of these small clusters over here. And if you actually go there and look closely, you'll see that uh, these, sorry, these three um, smaller uh, groups of clusters correspond to the three airports in, in New York City. So, so this uh, persistence is actually seeing this very multi-scale and multi-density structure in the data set and finding this smaller cluster corresponding to, to airports. And if you zoom into it, you see that it's actually separating different terminals in the airports. And, and if you want to go back here and choose a higher number of, of, of uh, clusters, um, you'll see that what happens is, in this specific case, uh, you're gonna start separating your uh, airports into more and more uh, terminals. So um, that's all I wanted to say about uh, Persistable. If you want to contribute, uh, please uh, get in touch. And the takeaway here is that degree reaps and the interactive approach to multi-parameter persistence works really well for some applications. Uh, that multi-parameter persistence in some specialized cases like clustering can be made very, very fast. And um, yeah, and that multi-parameter persistence modules can be very complicated as we saw in the Hilbert function. So, this uh, Luis, now... can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Are there short term or medium term or long term plans to sort of um, do H1 as well? Or is yes, that um... definitely awesome? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd love to talk about that more at the end of the talk, but yes. Very cool. Um, so, yeah, let's go into the descriptors for multi parameter persistence. Here's uh, one way in which you can understand the one parameter story. So the one parameter barcode is gonna represent a module as a formal uh, linear combination of its in the composable summons. So it's gonna take a persistence module and it's gonna return a Z, a linear combination with integer coefficients uh, of isomorphism classes of in the composable persistence modules. It just so happens that in one parameter persistence, the in the composables are the intervals. So you could say, uh, why, why can't we just do the same thing in multiple parameters? We can, we can try to take our module and decompose it into the composables and then take that to be our barcode. 
And the, the answer is that you can do that. There's kind of nothing stopping you from theorizing this. It is true that uh, in multi-parameter persistence uh, modules decompose uniquely as direct sums of in the composables. Uh, but there are some issues uh, with this decomposition. And this is kind of what is observed by uh, Carson and Somorodi and in kind of their, their fu uh, funding paper on multi-parameter persistence. The problem is that this set here, the set of all in the composable multi-parameter persistence modules, for example, already in two parameters, this set is kind of impossible to understand. And there are uh, some very precise ways in which representation theories can, can, can kind of, uh, describe in, in what sense it is impossible. But the, the conclusion is that if you would be able to do that, then I mean, you would solve a lot of things that representation theories just think that you can't solve. So, so it seems that we shouldn't try to be classifying um, all possible two parameter, all possible in the composable two parameter persistence modules. And then uh, another reason why this doesn't seem very promising from the now from the point of view of data analysis is that even if you could understand all possible in the composable persistence modules, uh, multi parameter persistence modules, um, and you could decompose give, uh, a given module, uh, this decomposition into the composables is actually highly unstable. So what we uh, proved with Ulrich Power recently is that in the case of two parameter persistence, in the composables are dense in the space of all modules when you use interleaving distance. So what that means is that if you take any module that has maybe a really nice decomposition, you can perturb it a, a very, very small amount, arbitrarily small, and get an indecomposable. And thus the composition into the composables, for example, the number of in the composables is a very, very unstable quantity. So one way to understand this is that, okay, maybe we shouldn't try to understand all, all, in, the compos all in the composables of a persistence module, but we should try to use an invariant that forgets some of the structure of the module. And uh, this is the way I understand uh, people have been doing this. This is not exactly how it's phrased in, I would say, all of these papers, the papers that I'm um, citing here, but I think all of them are kind of following this, this kind of uh, general outline. We're gonna try to break up the, the finding a geometric descriptor into two operations. First of all, we are gonna apply some additive invariant to our module and get some element of an abelian group. And second, we're gonna perform some algebraic operation to that invariant, and we are gonna get something more geometric. And I'll give you an example in the next slide. But for now, let me just define some terms. First of all, an additive invariant is a function that takes a persistence module. And here I'm gonna be using a, a general posit to index my persistence modules, because it doesn't really matter uh, for this level of generality, uh, which posit you're talking about. So an additive invariant takes a persistence module and it returns an element of an abelian group. And it is additive in the sense that it takes direct sums to sums. And now this sum makes sense because we are living in an abelian group. The invariant takes values in an abelian group. And it is uh, an invariant in the sense that if you have two modules that are isomorphic, then you get the same uh, output when you apply the invariant. Um, and let me give you some examples of additive invariant just to fix this, this idea. The Hilbert function is possibly the, the simplest additive invariant you can come up with. It's going to take a module and it's gonna return a function from the elements of the posit into um, the integers. And it's just gonna be the pointwise dimension as we were using uh, before. So given an, an element of P, it returns the dimension of the module at that element. And now this is an abelian group just using pointwise addition. Uh, a kind of a more interesting invariant is the one introduced by Carlson and Samorodian, the rank invariant. It's now taking values in the functions from the segments of the posit into the integers. And a segment uh, for me is just gonna be a pair of comparable elements. So it's gonna be a pair ij such that i is less than j in the posit. Uh, and it's the, what it returns is the function that on the pair ij returns the rank of the structure map of your module going from i to j. And again, this is an abelian group just by pointwise addition. Uh, and then finally, 
there's uh, several flavors of this kind of generalized rank invariant type of construction uh, that's also called uh, compressed multiplicities. Now there are some subtleties in how these things are uh, related, but I won't get into the subtleties. The main point here is that uh, all of these uh, papers are dealing with a construction that works like, uh, like the following. They take some uh, persistence module and in, they return a function now indexed, um, a function valued in, in the integers indexed by some collection of subposets of the poset P, typically a collection of intervals of P. And what you do is you take your module, you restrict it to that subposet, then you take the limit and you take the colimit, and there's always some canonical map between those two things, and then you take the rank of that map. And the point is that if you um, if you specialize this collection of subposets to be the poset of segments, so uh, things that look like this, that look like rectangles, then you get back this invariant. And this is why it's called the generalized rank invariant. So, okay, that's, that's what analytic invariant is. And this is kind of this part of the pipeline. So now the question is, okay, why, why do we want to go further? We, we kind of got a numerical invariant of the module in the form of the rank invariant, for example, why do we want to perform some algebraic operation? And, and the answer is, is because we want to get some, something more geometric. And, and the motivation comes from one parameter persistence. In one parameter persistence, um, the rank invariant looks like this. It's a perfectly numerical invariant. So this is the rank invariant of a module, of a one parameter persistence module. So for every um, segment, ij, it's returning an integer. Uh, but you see that if, if you just want to interpret the module and you look at this, it doesn't really tell you very much. And the kind of the more complicated your module is, the, the least this is going to help. Um, but what we actually look or like looking at is the persistence diagram, which uh, Amit Patel has observed that it is the Mobius inversion of this uh, function here. Now, exactly how Mobius inversion works is, is not going to matter for this uh, talk. All it matters is that it is an algebraic operation that takes an element of this uh, abelian group to an element of the same abelian group. And now I'm representing it here. These points should be ones, and the rest of the points are all zeros. So it's taking something that is kind of very hard to understand into something that is much more sparse, and that is really telling us about the number of features that, that we are interested in. Now, Kim and Memoli have realized that, uh, and actually Amit Patel before them, uh, that Mobius inversion works in, in a lot of generality. You don't need to be working one parameter persistence. Uh, in fact, Kim and Memoli show that you can do Mobius inversion for essentially any poset. Um, and, and what they do is they apply Mobius inversion to their generalized rank invariant to get kind of a more graphical uh, descriptor. So here's an example um, of the generalized rank invariant with respect to segments, so with respect to rectangles. And this is what is done in this paper by uh, Bodnan, Oberman, and Udot. If you, if you take this module, which is uh, some interval module, uh, but you're only uh, caring about its rank invariant and you apply Mobius inversion, you'll get this descriptor here, which is now some formal linear combination of rectangle modules. So these are three rectangle modules. And the important thing here, or one of the important things here, is that now uh, negative multiplicities can show up. In the one parameter case, we only get positive multiplicities. We might have repeated points and get a higher multiplicity than one, but we never get a negative thing. Uh, but in multiple parameters, negative things show up all the time. And that's, that's actually quite annoying and difficult. Uh, makes a lot of things much more difficult. Um, okay, so, so that's kind of the describing this framework of first computing an algebraic uh, invariant and then performing an algebraic operation to get something more geometric. So you may ask, okay, why Mobius inversion? What's so special about Mobius inversion? Why have we, have we been using it so much? Well, first of all, it works well in one parameter persistence, fine. Um, but, but I think there's, there's kind of a deeper reason why it, it works so well in, in many cases. And, and I think one way to say this is in the language of this paper. So uh, one, of the, one of my interpretations of, of the main uh, contributions of this paper is that they uh, kind of, they, they explain that Mobius inversion is a computational tool um, and that is good for computing the compositions. So what's a decomposition? Suppose I have an additive invariant. 
and I have a module, this additive invariant, let's call it alpha. And alpha decomposition of this uh, module is going to be a pair of modules, what I'm going to call d plus and d minus, such that the invariant on the module is equal to the invariant of d plus minus the invariant of d minus. OK, and here the idea is that the module can be very complicated, but I'm going to decompose its invariant with hopefully much simpler modules, d plus and d minus. So here's an example. The, the invariant that we're considering is again the, the rank invariant of Carlson and Samorodian. And here's a decomposition of that invariant for this module here. This module is not a rectangle, but we can uh, describe its rank invariant just using rectangles. And for that, we need to use negative things. So the, this is a, a decomposition because this is the positive part, this is d plus, and this is d minus. And uh, the usual rank invariant of the module is equal to the rank invariant of this thing minus the rank invariant of this thing. And they, they prove this in a lot of generality. So they, they show that if you choose basically any collection of intervals of, of a poset and, um, and, and essentially any module that takes values in, in uh, finite dimensional vector spaces, then you always have um, a, a decomposition of the rank uh, generalized uh, with respect to this uh, class of intervals. And uh, moreover, this decomposition is such that the positive and negative modules decompose as elements of this, in, this type of interval. So exactly like it, it, it works in this case. In this case, we are taking the usual rank invariant, which is the rank invariant with respect to segments. And we are decomposing the invariant of this module as uh, positive and negative segments, also known as rectangles. Um, and they show that. There is a unique minimal decomposition. So there, there, there are many decompositions, but if you want it to be minimal in the sense that um, no rectangle appears both as positive and as negative, then there is a unique one. And this minimal decomposition is usually computed by Mobius inversion. So the way I understand this is kind of proving some sort of universality of Mobius inversion, telling you from all the possible decompositions that you can care about, uh, for many, many uh, classes of intervals, the minimal one is given by Mobius inversion. OK, and then they, they use uh, this specific invariant, the rank uh, restricted to, to segments, so the usual rank invariant um, and, and, and the notion of the composition to get a notion of sign barcode. So now uh, I can represent segments as their diagonal, like that. And I can represent now the rank invariant of this module just with a collection of positive and negative uh, kind of two-dimensional barcode, where now I have positive bars and negative bars. And this completely characterizes the rank invariant of my module. And finally, they prove a stability result for this kind of uh, sign barcode. They, uh, the, the stability result that they have works as follows. On the right-hand side, you have the interleaving distance between your modules, as we would expect. And on the left-hand left side, you, will have, you want to have something more combinatorial. What they have is, first, they choose any two uh, rank decompositions of the modules. And they compare them using the matching distance, which uh, I'll recall very briefly in a second. But um, maybe more crucially, let's see what we have here. What we do have is the positive part of uh, the first sign barcode and the positive part of the second sign barcode on the left and right. And then the negative part of the first sign barcode goes on the other side and the same thing like that. If you're familiar with uh, sign measures and the sign Wasserstein distance, uh, you recognize this type of, of uh, formulation. So whenever you try to compare two sign measures, this is typically what you would do. You would compare them using something that compares only positive measures, and you will do this swapping of uh, the negative part goes to the other side in order to, to get something stable. So, and, and then finally, they, they compare it using the matching distance, which is a distance that works by uh, taking whatever you have here and taking whatever you have here, considering all possible one-dimensional slices, and then uh, taking a supremum so comparing the one-dimensional slices using barcodes and taking, taking a supremum. So um, they do have a nice stability result, 
Uh, but you may ask, okay, here we are using the matching distance. The matching distance requires us to consider all possible slices of these modules. So although this invariant is kind of a um, kind of a global invariant that has all these bars here, we are not matching bars to bars, but we are only matching restrictions of bars with restrictions of bars. So you may ask, can we put here uh, the bottleneck distance? That's the question. And what we observe in these papers is that you can't, uh, at least if you use the minimal decomposition. So if you use the decomposition that Mobius inversion gives you, you cannot put the bottleneck distance here uh, because the stability result doesn't hold anymore, even if, if you even if you allow me to put some constant here. So we don't have bottleneck stability for minimal decompositions. Uh, or in other words, we don't have bottleneck stability for uh, the compositions that Mobius inversion gives us. So this is part of the motivation uh, for, for considering other ways of, of getting the compositions. And this is the last part of, of my talk. So um, there's has, there has been several papers now that uh, basically build the compositions using homological algebra. And, and here's the kind of various ones that, that I am aware of. And uh, so again, the goal is to build the compositions, but instead of using Mobius inversion, we are using, you're going, we are gonna use homological algebra. And in the end, I'm gonna give you a stability result that kind of motivates this. So we're gonna say that a sequence is alpha exact. If, uh, so we, we have fixed an additive invariant alpha, and we're gonna say that a sequence is alpha exact if the invariant of the middle term is equal to the sum of the invariants of the other two terms. So this is a, a generalization of the notion of exactness. And now the nice thing is that in many cases, uh, alpha exact sequences form what it's called an exact structure. Now, what that exactly means doesn't matter for this talk. What matters is that once you have this new notion of exactness, you can still do homological algebra. And what you do is you replace every time that something says exact, you replace it with alpha exact. And every time that something says projective, you, re you replace it with alpha, alpha projective, um, which is just projective with respect to the alpha exact sequences. So in particular, what you can do is um, given a module, you can take a minimal alpha exact resolution of the module. So here's, here's an example. Here's uh, a module, and this is an alpha exact resolution of the module, um, a minimal one, uh, where alpha is the usual rank invariant. So the one by Carlson and Samorodian. And now what I can do is um, get a, an alpha decomposition using this uh, resolution. So given a minimal resolution, I'm gonna take all the terms that appear in even homological degrees, and I'm gonna put them as the positive. So as the, um, what we were calling C plus before, and then all the things that appear in odd homological degrees as negative. So here, here's the example for, for this module over here. Um, so I'm representing these projectives as um, bars like this, like that. Um, and I'm putting these bars with the corresponding sign um, here. So this is, this is completely, again, characterizing the rank invariant of my module. Uh, but this decomposition didn't come from Mobius inversion. Uh, it comes from using this notion of, of uh, minimal alpha exact resolution. And just to conclude, the nice thing about this setup is that now you can prove uh, bottleneck stability. You need to uh, check some conditions about your invariant or about your notion of alpha exactness. First of all, you need to know that alpha exact resolutions have, so, uh, have some uh, finite length. So there's some D such that minimal alpha exact resolutions have length at most t. And you need to show some bottleneck stability result for the alpha projectives. And I know that this gets kind of uh, hairy in the end. Let me just conclude with a picture showing how you can apply this for the rank invariant. So here are two modules, and here are the sign barcodes obtained using homological algebra uh, for the rank invariant. And these two modules are close in their living distance. And this is kind of the conclusion of this, of this um, result here applied to this case. Um, so you get this nice bottleneck matching between the, the bars. And now, um, as we saw before here, uh, you are allowed to match uh, things in positive, uh, the positive part of M with things in the negative part of M. And this is what's happening here, where I'm kind of canceling a positive and a negative bar of the same module. 
So that's all I wanted to say. Um, yeah, I'd I'll, I'll like to talk about this more. So please reach out if, if you have any anything you would like to ask or tell me about. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, let's go over to the question part. I like. Does anyone have a question right now? Otherwise, I can start with a question. Well, how about maybe we I just start with... first? Ah, yeah. Sorry, I forgot that. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Let's all unmute ourselves so that we can applaud together. <laughs> Um, okay, now the questions. So I'll start with one question to give other people some time to come up with questions themselves. You had in the very beginning this overview slide where maybe you can go back to that slide if it's easily possible. Um, so it was not the very first slide, but quite in the beginning. This one. Uh, yes, where exactly there was this big what else. So um, I feel like I missed, I think, the point where this answer <laughs> was, was uh, where this question was answered. What, what is the what else? Well, I mean, uh, yeah. I, so we have all these invariants that come from applying Mobius inversion to this generalized rank invariants, um, which are these positive and uh, this kind of sign barcodes type of things. And, and then we yeah. have a similar construction that comes from a homological algebra that does something very similar. Um, that is what we have so far. Um, now, th there are some examples. So if you go to um, this paper here, uh, you'll see many pictures for, for data sets. Um, something that happens in practice is that with these sign barcodes, um, you start having a lot of bars because mm -hmm. basically since you are allowed to have positive and negative things, uh, even if your module is kind of simple, you can have lots of positive things and, and negative things that kind of cancel with each other, um, mm -hmm. but, but you still see them. So kind of an open question is how, um, how useful is this for visualization? So we now have this, have this positive, uh, these sign barcodes, but for visualization, it's not, um, it's, it's not uh, currently, well, first of all, there isn't a lot of software for computing that, but then second of all, it's not clear how useful it is for, for visualization. Um, but but that's the status of it. As far as I know, there, there aren't any other approaches for visualizing uh, kind of uh, without having to choose some slices, just visualizing a complete uh, two-parameter filtration. There's kind of these sign barcodes that either come from Mobius inversion or from uh, homological algebra. I would say that's that's all the approaches that I'm aware of. That doesn't mean yeah. that there are anything, but... Great, thanks. Any other questions? Ah, I see Brenton is uh, raising his hand. Hi, I uh, really enjoyed your talk. Uh, thanks. Um, so I had a question about your uh, uh, the definition of alpha exact. Mm -hmm. So maybe you said it and I missed it. Um, when you define it, are you assuming that that sequence is short exact or it's just any, you know, maps between any like uh, complex or? Right. Uh, I mean, in, in most cases, you will want it. So in most cases, so take that, take alpha to be the usual rank invariant. Uh -huh. then, uh, if this is true, then in particular, you can evaluate at the segment II. You can evaluate the rank invariant at the segment II. And that is the dimension, just the, the Hilbert, is basically the Hilbert function. So what I'm saying is that for the case of the rank invariant, being alpha exact implies being exact in the usual sense. And, mm -hmm. and that's the case for many invariants. So you don't necessarily have to assume that this is exact to start with, but most invariants that you care about are stronger than the Hilbert function. And thus being alpha exact with respect to them implies being exact in the usual sense. Okay. So, so I can also think about it as that being like a short exact sequence with some sort of uh, additive uh, operation on it. Yeah, totally. All right, that was it. Thanks. And then before we already had the question about, um, ah, no, so sorry, I see that Rene is also, I think that's the question. Let's go with Rene first. 
Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, and thanks also for the very nice talk. Um, my question is rather a follow up um, of the questions uh, asked before, namely regarding these alpha decompositions and also invariants that you uh, want to have um, additivity. Um, would you assume or would you uh, request invariants to also be additive uh, with respect to these decompositions if we think about um, L and N as positive and negative uh, summons, so to say? Um, can, can you repeat? I, I don't, I'm not sure I understood. Yeah, so, so I understand these decompositions um, as um, kind of direct sums uh, in, in a positive and in a negative sense. Right, right. Um, not, not exactly, of course, but um, in some sense. So right, you could if, think of this as being some sort of negative sum, summon. Yeah, so if we think about um, invariants that we want to have additive, should it also be additive with respect to these negative summons or um, I see. is that kind of orthogonal? Uh, well, I mean, I, I would say, I would say it's kind of autom... Um, I mean, there, there is no like real formal notion of what it means to subtract a summon. So if you were if you were to make that precise in some sense, then yes, I would expect I would want my my invariant to be additive with respect to kind of negative direct sums. If yeah, I think know. formally formally one can do it with some uh, Grotenbeek construction ah, that's uh, also in one of these papers by mm -hmm. uh, Escola and uh, co-authors. Right, I see what you so, mean. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's going to be automatical by how you define. The Grodendy group. It's if if you work in the Grodendy group, then yes, the, 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 it's going to satisfy that it respects subtractions too. Oh, cool, thanks. Thank you. And then we also had the question during the talk about uh, higher dimensions, high, high dimensional homology for um, persistible. Um, you said that you wanted to maybe say more in the question bit, so I wanted to give you an opportunity to do that. Yeah, so, um, I mean, persistable works basically by being very fast at, uh, at doing one parameter slices. And, um, well, Ripser is very fast at doing one parameter slices. So, I mean, the, there is already design where we can just reuse Ripser to do that. You have to adjust it a little bit because Ripser is kind of only computing kind of the, the, the first one parameter slice, like the topmost, but you can adjust it to compute uh, other ones if you kind of reweigh your edges in some in some way. Um, and, and that is in the to-do list. I, I hope it will happen in the next month, but I mean, you know how that goes. That's great. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, I've got a question if, uh, if the audio is working. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, so uh, actually it's more of a comment. So Mobius inversion uh, goes back already to the very beginnings of the definitions of persistent homology from a paper in 1981 by Abiasis and Delfra. Uh, sorry, Abiasis, Delfra and Kraft. Uh, there's a, if you look at this paper, I can put it in the uh, in the comments, but if you look at this yeah. paper, there are pictures of barcodes there, actual uh -huh. drawn barcodes on the page. And on page, uh, on like the second page of the third page of this paper, there's uh, there's this <clears throat> Mobius inversion formula for counting the number of bars that go from I to J in right. terms of Mobius inversion. Um, yeah, please send it to the, to the chat. I mean, I, I wasn't aware of this and it sounds, it sounds excellent that that it's been known for so long. Yeah, uh, it came up. This I mean, they 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 were they were they were thinking of uh, geometry of representations of the type A or so they mm -hmm, would try to right. do the representation theory, the decomposition, and ask what uh, what what types there are, which is exactly what the uh, right. Is, is I see, see. Yeah, yeah. Please yeah, send let, it. Let me let me let me get that up, and I'll put it in the chat. It'll take me a second to get the the reference. Yeah, take your time. Okay, do we have any more questions for the recorded part? We can then also ask more questions um, once the recording is over.
<clears throat> okay, there's a reference there. Sorry, it's got Thank all this you. tech in it. Okay, it seems like there are no more questions for the recorded part, then I'll end the recording. But before that, I want to say again, thank you very much for this particularly nice talk. Thanks.